I will begin by chanting a text from Sino-Japanese Buddhist. Incomincerà col cantare un testo di buddismo sino-giapponese. For those of you who know neither English nor Chinese nor Japanese, quelli di voi che non sanno né l'inglese né il cinese né il giapponese, uh, uh, can listen to the music, which is the most important part. Ascolteranno la musica che è la parte più importante. It is a text called Highest Perfect Wisdom, Prajna Paramita. È un testo che si chiama uh, Altissima Perfetta Saggezza. Which is accepted by Tibetan Buddhists, Japanese Zen Buddhists, Mahayana and Hinayana. Che è accettato dai tibetani, dai, uh, dai, dai buddhisti, Vietnamese, Vietnamesi, <laughs> Vietnamiti, Zen, e dai Zen e, Mahayana, e dai Mahayana, Hinayana. E dai Hinayana. Ma ka Message two. Long since the years, letters, songs, mantras, eyes, apartments, bellies kissed, and gray bridges walked across in mist, 
Now your brother left Cadio's on welfare paid by the state. Now you're in New York beds with big poetic girls and go pick it on the street. I clang my finger cymbals in Havana. I lie with teenage boys afraid of the red police. I jack off in Cuban modern bathrooms. I ascend over the blue ocean in a jet plane. The mist hides the black synagogue. I will look for the golem. I will hide under the clock near my hotel. It's intermission time for tales of Hoffman. Nostalgia for the 19th century rides through my heart like the music of de Moldau. I'm still alone with long black beard and shining eyes, walking through night's dark, smoky tram car streets, slowly past royal muscular statues on an old stone bridge, over the river again today in Bruegel's wintry city. The snow is white on all the rooftops of Prague. Salute, beloved comrade. I'll send you tears from Moscow. Café in Warsaw. These specters resting on plastic stools, young specters with leather gloves, flitting through the coffee house one hour, specters with scarred faces or little chin beards, specter girls, black stockings, delicate heels, specter boys, blonde hair, combed neat over the skull. These new specters, legs crossed with scarves and Italian shoes, talking intensely, crowded together, late afternoon, smiling over low tables, with the sad soprano of history chanting through the high-fidelity loudspeakers, perspective walls and windows of 18th century streets curving down Novi Shriat, New World Avenue, to the high pedestal column, Sigmund III with his sword upraised, watching over Polish youth three centuries. Oh, Polish specters, what have you suffered since Chopin wept into his romantic piano? The rubble of old buildings coming down, gaiety of all-night parties under the air bombs, the first screams of the vanishing ghetto, the last pre-war pink and blue bedroom walls stand open to the demolition workmen, sunny afternoon. Now these specters gather to kiss each other's hand, girls kiss lip to lip, fine gold watches and red witch hair from Paris to sit by the yellow wall with a large brown briefcase, to smoke three cigarettes with thin black ties and nod heads over a new movie. Oh, specters sitting before the clean new walls of Warsaw, Christ and your bodies be with you for this hour while you're young in post-war heaven stained with the sweat of communism. Your loves and your white smooth cheek skin soft in the glance of each other's eye. Specters, how beautiful your calm, shaven faces, your upswept hair, thin eyebrows, pale lipstick, how beautiful your absent gaze, alone at table or with long eyelashes, how beautiful your patient love together sitting over the art journals, how beautiful your entrance through the blue velvet curtain door laughing into the overcrowded room, how you wait in your hats, measure the faces, and turn and depart for an hour, or meditate at the bar, waiting for the slow waitress to prepare red hot tea minute by minute, standing still as hours ring in the church bells, as years pass and you will remain on New World Avenue. How beautiful you press your lips together, sigh forth smoke from your mouth, rub your hands, or lean together laughing to notice this wild-haired madman who sits weeping among you, a stranger. Who be kind to? Who be kind to? Be kind to yourself, only one and perishable of many on the planet. Thou art that one that wishes a soft finger 
tracing the line of feeling from nipple to pubis, one that wishes a tongue to kiss your armpit, a lip to kiss your cheek inside your whiteness thigh. Be kind to yourself, Harry, because unkindness comes when the body explodes. Napalm, cancer, and the deathbed in Vietnam is a strange place to dream of trees leaning over and angry American faces grinning with sleepwalk terror over your last eye. Be kind to yourself because the bliss of your own kindness will flood the police tomorrow. Because the cow weeps in the field and the mouse weeps in the cat hole. Be kind to this place which is your present habitation with derrick and radar tower and flower in the ancient brook. Be kind to your neighbor who weeps solid tears on the television sofa. He has no other home and hears nothing but the hard voice of telephones. Click, bzzz, switch channel, and the inspired melodrama disappears and he's left alone for the night. He disappears in bed. Be kind to your disappearing mother and father gazing out the terrace window as milk truck and hearse turn the corner. Be kind to the politician weeping in the galleries of Whitehall, Kremlin, White House, Louvre, Phoenix City, aged, large-nosed, angry, nervously dialing the bald voice box connected to electrodes underground converging through wires vaster than a kitten's eye can see on the mushroom-shaped fear lobe under the ear of the sleeping Dr. Einstein crawling with worms, crawling with worms, crawling with worms. The hour has come. Sick, dissatisfied, unloved, the bulky foreheads of Captain, Premier, President, Sir, Comrade, Fear. Be kind to the fearful one at your side who's remembering the lamentations of the Bible and the prophecies of the crucified Adam, son of all the porters and char men of Belgravia. Be kind to yourself who weep under the Moscow moon and hide your bliss hairs under raincoat and suede Levi's. For this is the joy to be born, the kindness received through strange eyeglasses on a bus through Kensington, the finger touch of the Londoner on your thumb that borrows light from your cigarette, the smile of morning at Newcastle Central Station when long-haired Tom Blonde husband greets the bearded stranger of telephones, the boom bomb that bounces in the joyful bowels as the Liverpool minstrels of Cavern Sink raise up their joyful voices and guitars in electric Afric hurrah for Jerusalem, the saints come marching in, twist and shout, and gates of Eden are named in Albion again. Hope sings a black psalm from Nigeria, and a white psalm echoes in Detroit, and re-echoes amplified from Nottingham to Prague, and a Chinese psalm will be heard if we all live our lives out for the next six decades. Be kind to the Chinese psalm in the red transistor in your breast. Be kind to Monk Thelonious in the five spot who plays lone chord bangs on his vast piano, lost in space on a stool and hearing himself in this nightclub universe. Be kind to the heroes who have lost their names in the newspaper and hear only their own supplication for the peaceful kiss of sex in the giant auditoriums of the planet. Nameless voices crying for kindness in the orchestra, screaming in anguish that bliss come true, and sparrows sing another hundred years to white-haired babes, and poets be fools of their own desire. Oh, Anacreon and Angelic Shelley, guide these new nippled generations on spaceships to Mars' next universe. The prayer is to man and girl, the only gods, the only lords of kingdoms of feeling, Christs of their own living ribs, bicycle chain and machine gun, 
Fear, sneer, and smell, cold logic of the dream bomb have come to Saigon, Johannesburg, Dominica City, Phnom Penh, Pentagon, Paris, and Lhasa. Be kind to the universe of self that trembles and shudders and thrills in 20th century, that opens its eyes and belly and breast, chained with flesh to feel the myriad flowers of bliss that I am to thee a dream, a dream. I don't want to be alone. I want to know that I am loved. I want the orgy of our flesh, orgy of all eyes happy, orgy of the soul kissing and blessing its mortal grown body, orgy of tenderness beneath the neck, orgy of kindness to thigh and vagina, desire given with meat, hand, and cock, desire taken with mouth and ass, desire returned to the last sigh. Be kind to the poor soul that cries in a crack of the pavement because he has no body. Prayers to the ghosts and demons, the lack loves of capitals and congresses who make sadistic noises on the radio statue destroyers and tank captains, unhappy murderers in Mekong and Stanleyville. For a new kind of man has come to his bliss to end the Cold War he has borne against his own kind flesh since the days of the snake. Portland Coliseum. Brown piano, white round spotlight, Leviathan Auditorium, ribbed and wired, hanging organs and vox and black battery, a single whistling sound of 10,000 children's larynxes, a singing pierced the ears and flowing up the belly, the bliss of the moment, arrived, apparition, four brown jacket and Christ hair boys, goof Ringo batting the round white drum, silent George, Bluff hair, patient soul of horse, short black skulled Paul Witt, thin guitar, Lennon the captain, his mouth a triangular smile, all jump together to end some tearful memory song, ancient two years, and the million children of the thousand worlds bounce in their seats, bash each other's sides, press their legs together nervous to the move of the black knees of the musicians, Scream again and clap hand, become one animal in the New World Auditorium, hands waving myriad snakes of thought, screech beyond hearing, while a line of police with folded arms stands sentry to contain the red sweatered ecstasy that rises upward to the wired roof. First party at Ken Kesey's with Hell's Angels. Uh, Ken Kesey is an American novelist who uh, entered jail in San Francisco a week and a half ago. This poem is a description of a party at Ken Kesey's house with an, um, with an American fascist group called the Hells Angels. However, his, his uh, method of uh, um, communication with them, not anger, what he did was give them all LSD. Thereby, there was a transformation so that at the next peace march in Berkeley, the next manifestation of peaceableness in San Francisco, came adorned with flowers, holding hands with communist homosexuals, uh, <laughs> um, kissing the feet of sadomasochistic capitalists. Uh, they also had become peaceable communists, like everybody else. Communi communitists, commu uh, communalists. This is a description, then, of the first party at Ken Kesey's house with the Hells Angels. Cool black night through the red woods. Cars parked outside in the shade behind the gate. Stars dim above the ravine. A fire burning by the side porch and a few tired souls hunched over in black leather jackets. In the huge wooden house, a yellow chandelier at 3 a.m., 
and the blast of loudspeakers, hi-fi, rolling stones, Ray Charles, Beatles, Jumping Joe, Jackson, and 20 youths dancing to the vibration through the floor. A little marijuana in the bathroom, girls in scarlet tights, one muscular, smooth-skinned man sweating, dancing for hours, beer cans bent, littering the yard, a hanged man, sculpture dangling from a high creek branch, children sleeping softly in their bedroom bunks, and four police cars parked outside the painted gate, red lights revolving in the leaves. Uptown New York. Yellow Budweiser signs over oaken bars. I seen everything, said the bartender, changing $10. As I stared at him, amiably, eyes through an obvious Adamic beard, with Montana musicians, homeless in New York, teenage curly hair themselves. So we sat at the antique booth and gossiped, Madame Grady's literary salon, a curious value in New York. If I had my way, I'd cut off your hair and send you to Vietnam. <laughs> Bless you, then. I replied to the hatted, thin citizen leaving from bar to door upon wet, dark Amsterdam Avenue decades later. And if I couldn't do that, I'd cut your throat, he snarled farewell, and bless you, sir, I added as he went to his fate in the rain, a dapper Irishman. To the body, enthroned in plastic, Shrouded in wool, crowned by diamonds, transported in aluminum airplanes, shooed in synthetic rubber, fed by asparagus, ear lulled by electric mantra rock, chemical roses acrid in the nose, observant of large nostrilled air factories, every crack of the skin kissed by beloved grandmothers, adored by all animals, so Man, woman, child, our tender meat become consciously genital with a shudder and blush of substance, adorned with hair at crotch and brain, beard on lion and youth by fireside. Poem written yesterday, uh, it, uh, and there's no translation. Uh, the title would be Small Spoleto Mantra. Chica. Sì. Eh, questa è una poesia che ha scritto ieri, quindi manca una traduzione in italiano. E eh, il titolo sarebbe Piccolo Mantra di Spoleto. Since poetry is made of language, let's make language move, run, jump, clap, up, crash, bang, over the wall, stone, roads, zap, zoom, roar. Away, over, terrific, gone, bam, rat, bong, yep, shazam, boo, baffo, orchards, cock a doodle doo, trees, hurrah, dog, rar, 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 farms, cats, meow, wow, bark, slam into it, cows, moor, motorcycle, grazoom, sabacadabra, svaha, pet, 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 om, svaha. This poem uh, is called uh, Man, and it's a prologue to what was to be a long, long poem. It's not very long. Uh, the good scope of him is history, old and ironic, not modern history, unfulfilled and blurred. Bleak, damp, fierce, thunderous lightning days. Poor caveman, so scared of the outside, so afeard of its power and beauty, created a limit and called that limit God. Cell, fish, ape man, Adam, how was the first man born and why has he ceased being born that way? Air his fuel, will his engine, legs his wheel, eyes the steer, ears the alert. He could not fly, but now he does. The nails, hair, teeth, bones, blood, all in communion with the flesh. The heart that feels all things in life and lastly feels in death. 
The hands and looks and action are masterful. The eyes, the eyes. The penis is a magic wand, and the womb greater than spring. I don't know if he be Adam's heir or kin to ape. No man knows. What a good driving mystery. I can imagine a soul, and the soul leaving the body, the body feeding death, and death simply a hygiene. I can wonder the world, the factory of the soul, the soul putting on a body like a workman's coveralls, building, unbuilding, rebuilding. But that man can think soul is the great, strange, wonderful thing. So in the beginning was the word man has spoken. The Jews, the Greeks, the Romans, chaos groping behind. Exalted dignity sings. The blind angel Sithara twang no chain reaction that world war be the Trojan War. Not with the goddess Eris denied a wedding seat. No praise of man in my war. Wars have lost their legendariness. So the Bible sings man in all his glory. Great Jew, man is hard stem of you. Was you first spoke love, O noble survivor? The Greeks are gone, the Romans are gone, and the Egyptians have all but vanished. Your testament yet holds. The fall of man stands a lie before Beethoven and a truth before Hitler. Man is the victory of life, and perhaps I might feel Christ be the victory of man. King of the universe is man, creator of gods. He knows no thing other than himself, and he knows himself the best he can. He exists as a being of nature and sustains all things in being. His dream can go beyond existence. Greater the rose, the simple bee doesn't think so. When man sings, birds humble into piety. What history can the whale empire sing? What genius ant dare break away from anthood as man can from manhood? So King Agamemnon, Homer, but ah, uh, mortal infliction. I think of Polyphemus bellowing his lowly woe. Seated high on a cliff, sun-tight legs dangling into the sea, his fumbling hands grappling his burnt eye. And I think he'll remain like that because it's impossible for him to die. Ulysses is dead. By now he's dead. And how wise was he who blinded a thing of immortality? Reflection in a green arena. Uh, where marble stood and fell into an eternal landscape, I stand ephemeral. Anchored to a long season and a quick life, I am not wearied, nor feel the absence of former things, my relation to my country, the weak dreams, their weaker success, the reactions to death and lovelessness, and oh, and now I know, having had enough of her, how women suffer. And that hate which men bash against men suffers less and is with end. But a woman's loss, endless. Hope seems an evacuated place, an insufferable riot's mess. But to see a child comb his face, is this hopelessness? Then a postage stamp is. And those challenges encountered unexpectedly if to hesitate or stay, or if to run or walk away, the heart is unable to tell the heart. This is for Mr. Minotti. Yes. <laughs> uh, when I, written when I found out that his was an unmarked grave. Not yours, but another composer's. <laughs> uh, children, children, don't you know Mozart has nowhere to go This is so Though graves be many, he hasn't any <laughs> Very early uh, Faistos is a village with 25 families Is the title of the poem Faistos is um, in Crete um, The other end of Heraklion so. But just 25 families living there So Faistos is a village with 25 families And one taverna there my friend and I sat, drinking with the tallest Greek in the world. 
And though he must have been close to 60, his face and body seemed those of a strong young prince. We could not speak each other's language, but drink after drink, we talked about everything. And I learned by my little German and my companion's little Greek and the others their little French and English. He shot 20 German officers, but he wouldn't shoot a soldier. He says they were young and good. But now that the war is over and no more officers, he's unhappy. He's unhappy because the village has forgotten his heroics. He sighed a sigh which seemed to say, those were the good old days. Having drunk so much, I had to go to the toilet. So did my friend and almost all the others, but there was no toilet. Thus out into the pitch dark we staggered, behind the Tavana we went, where beneath the starriest sky I ever did see, we all did wondrously pee. Now, my part of this uh, program with Mr. Craig's uh, is extremely simple. I'm only going to read some sections uh, from a work in progress. The second volume will be out in London and New York next year, called the comprehensive title of which is The Dream Song. To describe it very quickly, uh, it's a poem on which I've been working for 12 years about a man named Henry. Now, Henry has a friend who calls him Mr. Bones, and variants on that. Uh, there's an elaborate cast of characters, but the poem is all about Henry, just one man. And it's done in terms of what T.S. Eliot said we must not do. That is to say, it is strictly about a personality a characteristic tone. Henry is an American uh, in early middle age. Uh, things shift in the songs. They remember, they're called dream songs. Uh, but at one point, he is given the age of 41. And he is in blackface. And he has many problems. Triumphs, but, but problems. Uh, the poem is very long, uh, but the sections, the songs, are very short. Only 18 lines in three six-line stanzas. This is the first one. No title, no dedication. Huffy. Now, I must, ex I must tell you that critics in various parts of the world find my work very difficult. And I do the best I can to be clear. Huffy Henry hid the day. Unappeasable Henry sulked. I see his point. Uh, trying to put things over. It was the thought that they thought they could do it made Henry wicked and away. But he should have come out and talked. All the world, like a woolen lover, once did seem on Henry's side. And then came a departure. Uh, thereafter, nothing fell out as it might or ought. I don't see how Senator Henry Pride open for all the world to see. Survived. What he has now to say is a long wonder the world can bear and be. Once in a sycamore I was glad all at the top and I sang. Hard on the land. Where's the strong sea? And uh, empty grows every bed. And 
number five that says about a, a trip, uh, a trip from uh, New York to New Delhi. We begin in New York. Perhaps I'd better say to you uh, that the, the mountain that is crossed by this plain is the great peninsula in northeastern Greece. One of three. Henry Saxon de Bar, and was odd. Off in the glass, from the glass. At odds with the world and its God. His wife is a complete nothing. St. Stephen, getting even. Henry Saxon de Plain, and was gay. Careful, Henry, nothing said aloud. Uh, but where a virgin out of cloud to a mountain dropped in light, his thought made pockets, and the plain bucked. Pardon me, lady, she says, all right. Henry lay in the netting while, while the brain fever bird did scale. Mr. Heartbreak, the new man, the French is Crevecoeur. Mr. Heartbreak, the new man, come to farm a crazy land. An image of the dead on the fingernail of a newborn child. Uh, this is uh, number eight. Very uh, blue man. Uh, they took away his teeth, white and helpful. Bothered his backhand. That's tent. They halved his green hair. Uh, they blew out his lungs, his entrails. Underneath, uh, they called in iron voices. Understand is nothing. So there. Uh, the weather was very fine. Uh, they lifted off his covers till he showed and cringed and pled to see himself less. They installed mirrors till he flowed. Enough, I murmured there. If you will watch us instead, yet you may save me. Yeah. The weather flared. They weakened all his eyes and burning thumbs into his ears, and shook his hand like a notch. They flung long, silent speeches off the hook. They sandpapered his pompous hope, so capsized. They took away his crotch. Uh, this is number 14. Uh, when I published in the United States, I had a lot of correspondence about it. Uh, people didn't like it. That's a good reception. 
I was delighted. And uh, it was in a magazine, which I never published in, called Harper's. God knows why I did. And the editor told me later on uh, that he had never had so much unfavorable <laughs> correspondence about any poem that they ever published. He said, I didn't know anybody read those things. <laughs> A life, friends, is boring. We must not say so. After all, the sky flashes, the great sea yearns, away ourselves flash and yearn. And moreover, my mother told me as a boy, repeating, ever to confess you're bored means you have no inner resources. I conclude now I have no inner resources because I am heavy bored. People bore me. Literature bores me, especially great literature. Henry bores me with his plights and gripes as bad as Achilles, which is spelt with rage with a small letter at the beginning. Who loves people and valiant art, which bores me. And the tranquil hills and gin look like a drag and uh, somehow a dog has taken itself and its tail considerably away into mountains or sea or sky leaving behind meat wag oh this is an awful even by my standards, which are very high. <laughs> Henry is a man without tolerance. You know the word tolerance in relation to drugs? Everything bothers him. Henry's pelt was put on sundry walls where it did much resemble Henry. And them persons was delighted, especially his long and glowing tail. By all them was admired, and visitors, they whistled. This is it. Golden, whilst your frozen diapers, where at midnight, a gleams on you is fur and silky and black. A mission accomplished, pal. Uh, my molten yellow and moonless bag, a drain, hangs at rest. Collect in the cold depths. Barracuda. I, in Shialda Station, terrible place in Calcutta, some possessionless children survived to die. The Chinese communes hum to daiquiris, withdrew into a corner of the gorgeous room, and one told the other a lie. muttered Henry. It's a conversation between Henry and the devil. Muttered Henry, Lord of matter. Thus, upon some more unquiet spirit, knock. Uh, my madnesses have ceased. All the quarter astonishes a lonely out and back. 
They set their clocks by Henry House, the steadiest man on the block, and Lucifer. I smell you for my own, by smug. And Henry says, what have I tossed you but the least, though hard, fit for your ears? Uh, your servant, bored with horror, sat alone with busy teeth, while his dislike increased unto himself in tears. And he, oh, promising to spare in solitude. Henry says, and there, your avenues are dying. Leave me. I dove under the oaken arms of Brother Martin, St. Simeon, the lesser theologian, Bodhidharma, and the Baal Shem Tov. Uh, this is the end of the first volume, the end of book three, that is to say. Uh, this is number 77. C.D. Henry rose up shy and deworld and shaved and swung his barbells, deuded Henry up, and paid poor thousands of persons on topics of grand moment to Henry are to them less and none with a book of his in either hand. He is stripped down to move on. His friend says, come away, Mr. Bone. Henry goes on. He often talks about himself in the third person and even in the second person. That's a feat. Henry is tired of the winter and haircuts and a squeamish, comfy, ruined, prone, proud national mind and spring in the city so called. Henry likes fall. He would be prepared to live in a world of fall. Forever, impenitent Henry, but the snows and summers grieve and dream. These fierce and airy occupations and love raved away so many of Henry's years it is a wonder that, with in each hand, one of his own mad books and all, ancient fires for eyes, his head full and his heart full, he's making ready to move on. <laughs>